I'm Lori Patricki, publisher at O'Reilly Media, and I'm here with Alex Payne of Simple. Today, we're going to be talking about Scala in this latest Code podcast. Welcome, Alex. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Oh, great. You know, I'm hearing a lot about functional programming languages these days. So why mm -hmm. should someone learn and use Scala? So I think Scala's sweet spot is that it's not a strict functional programming language. Uh, languages like Haskell or uh, OCaml or, or F Sharp, other languages in the ML family, um, they're very strictly functional. That's the only way that you can approach your program. And Scala was designed from the ground up to be a hybrid object functional language. So you have the familiar object-oriented tools from languages like Java or Ruby, uh, as well as the world of you know interesting functional approaches available to you at, at all times. Uh, that means that you as the programmer have to use your best judgment as to which of those two approaches is right for the task at hand, but having the ability to choose between both of them and to blend them together is really Scala's advantage. Yeah, and, and what sort of advantages do you get sort of combining object-oriented and a functional language? Well, I think the, the nice thing, at least for, for a lot of the work we do, is if we have to interface with a legacy system that has been built in a very object-oriented way and exposed over a, a protocol like SOAP, which is very much designed for an object-oriented world, mm -hmm. then we can write that code in an, an OOP style and uh, you know not, not have to kind of map it into this functional uh, mindset. But then other parts of our programs that don't need to interface with those systems where we just want to, you know, say we have this data and we have these transformations over that data, that we can keep uh, more purely functional uh, and, and we have a little bit more confidence in, in reasoning about how that code is going to work and perform. Mm -hmm. And so, so those are advantages that folks can have primarily when they're working with web apps? Uh, you know, a, a lot of that a lot of that work that, that we do interfacing with legacy systems, uh, they're, they're sort of isolated services. They're not web apps per se. We take a bunch of those services written in Scala and glue them together with some other tools, and that forms the basis of, of a web architecture for us. But there are uh, sort of full stack web frameworks like Rails or Django available in the Scala world as well, if that's the approach you like to take. OK. So can you give some really good examples of, of instances where you'd want to use Scala? Sure. Uh, so people people have found it useful for uh, backend service development, where say you you need you have a, a data store like uh, Postgres or HBase or that sort of thing, and you want to encapsulate a nice way of talking to that data store along with some business logic that's relevant to what you do. Scala is a perfect fit for that. Um, the fact that it runs on the JVM means you can use existing Java libraries to talk to any of those data stores. Uh, but then you have a bunch of nice tools in the language to make your code succinct, maintainable, uh, predictable. Uh, so that that's a sweet spot. Uh, people have been using Scala in uh, financial applications. Uh, I, I know of a bunch of folks who are using it inside of, uh, uh, you know, hedge funds, trading firms, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's generally been a, been kind of a sweet spot for functional languages. Um, I mean, really, the the name Scala comes from uh, a concatenation of, of the word scalable language, mm -hmm. and its designers have always thought of it as a language that could be used from very small scripting tasks on up to building big distributed systems. It, it seems like it's been adopted more at the, at the larger end of that spectrum, uh, more at the distributed systems side. Uh, people can do scripts in, in Scala, but uh, I think because package management tends to be a little bit challenging in, in the, the Java JVM world, uh, it's, it's a little harder to put together a little script that relies on a couple of libraries and hand that to someone else. Uh, it's harder to do that in Scala than it is in a language like, say, Ruby or Python. Okay. See, I, I think I've read a few things where there's it's been suggested that Scala could actually replace Java uh, in a programming environment. Do you think that's true? I think that it's true if you're building something from the ground up that doesn't rely on uh, 
legacy Java libraries or, or, or talking to any, any sort of legacy system. I think you could write your whole application, your whole system purely in Scala. Um, in our case, we run into enough uh, Java code or, or enough Java libraries that we're dependent on that really our developers have to be familiar with both Java and Scala. Uh, and they may not end up working much in Java day to day, but you know, a couple of times a month, they're going to have to dive into some Java code to fix a bug or add a feature, that that kind of thing. So it's it's not quite there yet, um, but I think as as more and more people are writing pure Scala libraries, and and that ecosystem of of um, libraries grows bigger and bigger, it becomes more and more possible to just stay in the the Scala world. Great, great. Hey, I know you joined Simple a couple of years ago, uh, and you're doing a yes. lot of great things for uh, innovative financial services for individuals. So has the team used Scala for development there? Yes, yeah. So so um, our, our language stack is Scala for back-end services, uh, a little bit of Ruby for uh, kind of gluing those services together, as well as a couple of internal applications, and then a lot of JavaScript and Objective C for our web and mobile applications, respectively. Um, so really, the, those Scala services are just handing JSON documents back and forth uh, that then ultimately end up being read in by uh, you know our, our iOS application or our web application, mm -hmm. and you know formatted and manipulated in various ways, and um, that that's a that's sort of a an architectural approach that Yammer and some other companies have taken. Um, I know Yammer experimented with Scala for a while and ultimately decided to move uh, more in the direction of just pure Java that that made more sense for them. But that general approach of saying we're we're going to use a, a very powerful language on the back end. Um, and then, uh, you know, more flexible, dynamic languages on the front end uh, se seems to work pretty nicely. Oh, great. You know, I read somewhere that you want a better software development experience. For so what advice do you have for coders in order to help them achieve those goals? In, in Scala specifically? In Scala or in general. So, uh, I mean, in, in the Scala world, there, there is IDE support, and it continues to get better from year to year. Uh, TypeSafe, which is the commercial company that's been set up to support Scala, uh, they've invested some resources in improving the Scala IDE for Eclipse. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm not an experienced Eclipse user. Uh, I've used IntelliJ IDEA, uh, which seems to work great for a few months at a time, and then Scala and, and IDEA will sort of get out of sync, and then there'll be a couple of weeks where it's not usable, and then it gets back into sync and works again. Um, personally, I, I do most of my Scala development in Emacs with a plugin called Enzyme, and that works great. Enzyme's very powerful. Uh, it does most of what you would want from an IDE, but it lets you stay in your comfortable Emacs environment. And uh, I, I guess my, my advice for developers would be that learning an environment like Emacs and taking the time to, to customize it and really make it your own is worthwhile. Uh, it can seem like sort of a, a frivolous investment of time when you're uh, on the clock and, and you know really pushing to get something done. But every little improvement that you make uh, really adds up over the years. Mm -hmm. And if, if you have some you know keystroke that's exactly what you expect that takes care of some repetitive thing you do every day, uh, it's, it really ends up being beneficial. Great, great. Um, well, I want to let everyone know that Alex is the author of Programming Scala from O'Reilly, and uh, you should certainly look at look uh, for that on O'Reilly.com or any other stores. And I really want to thank Alex for taking uh, a bit of time today and talk about Scala with us. Thanks, sure Alex. Sure thing. My pleasure.